Večer, dobrodošli na reviju Mali knjiža Eurosti Island drugi dan. I ja ću sad odmah prebaciti na engleski. So, welcome to the review of small literature Iceland. Today in this conversation we have two great authors of the younger generation from Iceland, whose prose you can find in the anthology Svjetlucaju Ledene Perle. So here with us are Bergthora Snebjörnsdottir and Eva Rún Snorredottir. Did I say it right? Bergthora and Eva, once again I wish you a warm welcome to Buxa and the review of small literatures and Zagreb in general. So I would just like to start uh, with, uh, uh, with uh, just saying a few short uh, biographical facts just, just so the audience can know uh, like bits and bobs and details from your biographies. Uh, Bertora Snebjörn Zotir lives and works in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, she made her literary debut in 2011 with Dylan Days, a collection of poetry, her second collection of poetry of Florida came out in 2017 and was nominated for the Icelandic Literary Award. In 2019, uh, her first novel, Pighead, was published to considerable uh, uh, critical acclaim, and the, the part of the Pighead was actually translated uh, and published in the um, anthology. It received uh, the Icelandic Women's Literature Prize, the Icelandic uh, Booksellers Literary Prize, and was nominated for the Icelandic Literary Award. Her latest work is the experimental novel, novel Everything That Flows, coming out uh, actually this October, and uh, tonight we will hear um, her reading it. Eva Rún Snorradottir is an independent theatre artist and a writer. She's a member of two performance groups, the extended life performance group uh, Kavis Boom Bang and Sixteen Lovers. Uh, she has published four books and won the Best Poetry Book Award in Iceland in 2019. Uh, Eva Rún regularly teaches and mentors in the Icelandic Academy of Art and she was the house uh, playwright for the Reykjavik uh, City Theatre from 2020 to 2021. So, uh, Bertora and Eva, you both actually write uh, both prose and poetry, and I mean, we will talk about it uh, in a minute. Now, just at the beginning, uh, I would like to uh, ask you, like, what, what was your initial reaction when you got this uh, invitation to come here to this a uh, literary festival of peculiar uh, name, a review of small lit literatures, and you know how how you reacted when you uh, uh, realized you will be translated into Croatian language. What were your your first thoughts? <laughs> wow, that's a good question. Uh, when was it? Back in <laughs> yeah, a few months ago. Yeah, my memory usually I, I can only I can barely remember what I did today. But um, yeah, I, I don't really I, I don't really read my uh, emails very well, um, so I just scanned through it and saw that it was an invitation, and uh, I've always wanted to visit Zagreb and uh, love Croatia and Croatian language, so mm -hmm. I, I didn't really realize the anthology part right away. Okay. <laughs> and how do you feel now, having your work uh, in this uh, anthology? Uh, it's Amazing, I love it. Okay, that's great. You are, you are. Yeah, I, I was. Uh, it's just really. Um, it's so uh, great to be translated like mm -hmm. into other languages. Mm -hmm. So I was really happy just about that part, and also I remember thinking like, Sakre, oh, I hope we will go there, because at first it was just about the book, which, which I was like really happy about and I think I, I replied actually will we come to Zagreb because yeah I was uh, that came it. to my mind so happy okay that's uh, that's great to hear 
just recently I read your uh, short biographies that already tell uh, a lot, but I would like to know what uh, didn't uh, fit, what didn't make it to the biography. So what uh, preoccupies you in your work, whether it be uh, literature or something else? What is it that we can't find out from the biographies about you and about uh, from these uh, works in the anthology? What do you do? What are your pre preoccupations like? What are the subjects you're interested in? Mm -hmm. um, what do you do in the theater, for example, with your performance groups? Yeah, uh, yeah that's a good question. Uh, I've been um, uh, for seven years or something, some more probably, uh, exploring normality, like doing uh, researches with this group you mentioned, Quiz Bang, and doing these uh, uh, researches with audience, exploring uh, normality. We did, for example, uh, Norm Olympics, <laughs> where people like uh, took part and performed the tasks of uh, everyday life as someone else in a like borrowed home and with a borrowed uh, personality for five uh, hours um, and in the end they got this uh, gold medal if they like made it through the normal Olympics so that's um, that explains like our uh, uh, goal quite well and and then I've continued with this in writing also mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. kind of uh, uh, unlearning what we have learned from from yeah from all our life mm -hmm. unlearning and looking at like rules and values and from a different perspective yeah. Okay, great. You, Victoria? Uh, yeah, I don't really know how to answer the question. Um, um, I was obsessed with books uh, for as long as I can remember. Um, I would just read. My parents would tell me you have to you know, get some exercise or you would have a child-sized heart your whole life, uh, which I totally believed, um, but I didn't really care. So maybe I have a child-sized heart still, I don't know. Um, <clears throat> but now I try to do other things too than reading. Um, and then when I was a teenager, I started drinking moonshine. Um, I'm from the countryside. There's not a lot of uh, things to do in the countryside. So I read, and then I started drinking moonshine and, then, and other strong liquor that I would steal from my father. And then I... Uh, I uh, stopped with the books for a little bit, but then I picked it up again. And um, I've always been very interested in, I, I don't know, for me, you know, writing is, uh, it's, a, you know, it's very intuitive, mm -hmm. and you can't really see a pattern until somebody else reads it and then they tell you. So I've been told mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of my work is like uh, around, um, uh, you know, generational trauma and, um, maybe, you know, the darker sides mm -hmm. uh, that we all carry and um, how funny they can be and ridiculous and, uh, and um, yeah, so I, I think like life is tragic and hilarious, so I think that's kind of what I'm working on. Yeah, that's, that's a great way to, to sum it up, to sum life up, so. Okay, uh, so the ne next question, uh, I already said something uh, in the beginning. Uh, you both write both prose and poetry and have been award awarded for uh, both. So I was wondering, um, how do you look at those two forms? Is there anything specific you are preoccupied with when you write poetry as opposed to prose? Are there some subjects, themes you um, deal with in poetry and some other you deal it, uh, with in prose? Just what is your uh, view on those two forms? I think I deal with the same subjects. 
or like I find the same things interesting, funny, you know, like it, it revolves a lot, a lot around characters for me um, uh, and the narrative. But um, it's different, writing poetry and prose is different because when you write uh, prose, like fiction, a novel, it's a lot of labor and it's like running a marathon. You want to give up a thousand times along the way, or that's how I feel at least. Um, and I don't really enjoy it in a way. I enjoy it when I get really into it, but um, but it's also very difficult, you know, because you because it's like running a marathon. Um, <clears throat> so it's um, you have to really get out of yourself to get to read a a novel is what I've found. You have to really uh, step out of your own psyche and your own ego and like get absorbed in a different world. Whereas when you're writing poetry, it's more um, there's more freedom. It's um, more playful in many ways, um, and it's more based in reality. Okay. Yeah. Because uh, do you, you have a comment? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say that, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, very, very. Could you maybe elaborate it a bit more? Yeah, um, so when you're writing poetry, um, it's, um, it's more like you don't have to get, like when you're in a novel, you have to really emerge yourself into, like you have to really be out of your mind, you have to be crazy, like you have to hear voices. Whereas poetry, is like a, you can use it as a, it's like a catharsis in a way. It's like a class. Um. Yeah, it's so. Uh, yeah, it's such, such, such a great uh, statement because usually it's uh, uh, writers come in the other way around. I, I feel so. It's good to hear the other uh, perspective. Just for me personally. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, Eva, you? Um, yeah, I think. Um, I'm always, I can't get out of this catharsis feeling. Uh, I, I cannot uh, write a narrative, a character, especially a character. Uh, it's just, I, I have this, maybe it's a lack of uh, focus or also just this inbuilt resistance of always trying to like uh, erase. Um, Characters. If I write a prose which has a character, I just there comes. Uh, uh, I can't uh, go any further with it. So I I'm kind of stuck in this uh, just this uh, small uh, like uh, a picture of things. These kind of short texts that I'm kind of. Uh, getting this catharsis uh, or trying I don't know it just I'm trying to uh, just uh, find the space or like taking it's like taking uh, the snow from your house in winter <laughs> writing you know if I if I don't do it it's just like I feel like I, I can't see further you know yeah. and if you even though you have done it it's always you're in constant this cultural autopilot mm -hmm. in life you and everybody i mean there's no way getting out of that so writing for me is just like a very uh, there is no uh, uh, there is no way of it just it's very chaotic i just do something and like with Bergthora and you said something someone says like this or maybe I find out myself after like uh, printing it out and like framing it on the floor like oh there is some threat here and then you can take it further but I can never get any like um, yeah organized around it so I think I could not write a novel because of that <laughs> No, it's a way of dealing with the world, I think. And it's also, yeah. it's such a safe space because a book is just a book, so you can really explore the things that you are afraid to think and are afraid of, and it's just a book, so. Yeah, in the Flash interview for Books HR, you wrote that 
um, you write to understand what you find uh, strange or what you don't understand, right? Something like that. So to uh, move uh, on to the anthology, Sigurd uh, Sayulad and Perlen. Uh, so uh, Bertora, uh, so you you are both actually represented with prose, not uh, the poetry. Uh, Bertora, we have your excerpt from the novel Pickhead or uh, Svinska Glava, uh, which is given from a perspective of a woman who. Um, uh, has an obsession in your word, or that has actually uh, an OCD uh, uh, disorder. Uh, it uh, prevents her from uh, doing her like everyday life uh, actions, and uh, much more specifically, it prevents her from uh, taking care of her uh, child. So actually, actually, it's also about like postpartum depression, who is uh, uh, like. Uh, consequence or a symptom is like um, uh, OCD. It's also obviously about lots of like internal fights of a woman who also has a young, who has a baby who she can t take care of. It's like it's very raw, uh, it's very like unfiltered, uh, it's uh, um, in my opinion, it's like one of the best representations of OCD in the literature that I have read um, so far. So it's it's, it's great. Uh, I mean, you will have the chance to read it in the uh, anthology. But I was just wondering, uh, um, you know, the the pig head. Uh, what is it that we can't read in the excerpt in the anthology? What are we missing from the novel? Why uh, pig head? And you know, just to tell us a bit more about the writing process uh, of the novel. Uh, so the novel is uh, called Pig Head. Um, it's uh, after one of the characters. It's, uh, it revolves around three characters, uh, Pickett, which is an elderly man from the countryside, from a village in Iceland by the seaside, um, and um, Helena, which is the woman um, you described, and then the boy, which is uh, the third character. So the story uh, is about um, an older man who, who um, imports a wife from Asia who comes with her young son in the 90s to Iceland and uh, which is the boy the third character and how he got the name Pickett um, so I lived in China uh, back in 2005 for a little bit less than a year and um, uh, I had two uh, Chinese friends that were opening up a cafe and uh, one of them was always called, you know, my friend, uh, a girl, would always call her friend Pickett, uh, Juto. And I thought it was because he had a very large head, and maybe that was the reason. He didn't really, I mean, I couldn't really see that he had a very large head. To me, his head was perfectly normal, but, um, um, but yes, he always called him Juto. And then uh, when I was starting to write, uh, this novel, I was um, doing a residency in the countryside, in a seaside village in Iceland, and I was looking out the window, and I started, um, you know, on this island, and I was googling Pickett uh, in Chinese, and thinking, like, why, what, what is this? And then I found out that younger women in China would often call their boyfriends Pickett, Juto, um, like an endearing term. Uh, like a cutie pie or something, but it's but it's also an insult. It can also mean you're stupid or you know big-headed. So I thought, was he her boyfriend, or was it because he had a large head, or you know, <laughs> I, I will never know. But um, and yeah, so I thought um, it, it's interesting this like this term, how something can have how words can have a double-sided meaning, and and so I. Um, that's the story of like how this man, uh, farmer type, uh, got was called Pickhead by his wife, and we don't know why. Like if it's if it was an endearing term or if it was it, you know, she was making fun of him, mocking him. Thank you for clearing that up. I actually couldn't like realize it from the excerpt at all. So thank you. <laughs> Uh, uh, Eva, uh, in the anthology, we can find your fourth, uh, four uh, short stories uh, from the collection of short stories uh, Oskila Munir, 
Okay, so lo lost and found, right? Uh, or izgubljeno i uh, nađeno, as we translated it. The translated stories, like I'm now like generally speaking, not to get into details, are about uh, difficulties growing up, uh, like first relationships, first human contact, then the the the, the shame around it, uh, the fact that it often ha that it can happen too soon, and everything that um, comes with it. So it, it can be uh, quite uh, disturbing at times. Uh, you will uh, have actually have a chance to hear it when Eva reads it. Uh, so, uh, as I said, I'm like very like generally speaking now, uh, but uh, I would just like to ask you, as Berthora, can you tell us a bit more about the stories, about other stories in the collection, and you know also about the idea and the writing process of the uh, this uh, short story collection? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, it's. Uh... Uh, I started writing this book when I was uh, going through a divorce uh, three years ago. So uh, some texts, there's one threat in it, which is like uh, uh, about uh, divorces and breakups and kind of this, uh, yeah, this uh, large life event, which is like such a, like this, uh, what do you say, like this trans transmissions you go through life, th go through in life, and uh, other also this uh, other transmissions. Is that the right word? Transmission? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then... Uh, transitions. Transitions, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Ooh, good that, that cleared. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> Ooh, transmissions now. Okay. Uh, yeah, and then uh, and then I get also uh, just started uh, that kind of made the kind of style. So I I was um, inspired to write kind of in similar way. Of, like I get inspired from my experience in life and also. Uh, my friends' experience often write about their life with their also acceptance in their, in their with their permission. <laughs> What's, I, my words are escaping me. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think uh, I was. Uh, uh, the title comes from. Uh, I was uh, researching these uh, feelings uh, when you do not go through feelings they they stay they tend to like stay in your body and come out as something else like a nervous breakdown or or something you know uh, explore why we do things and why we act the way we act and also this threat of uh, uh, which comes from like like we've talked about uh, I come from the theater and then there were always looking at uh, like breaking down theater and and what's theater and like looking at uh, everyday life as a theater and ev looking at everything as a performance and there there are a lot of a uh, lot of stories about uh, performances in this book and also uh, the heteronorm which is just uh, my dealings like I'm a lesbian and I'm I'm always uh, dealing with um, the heteronormative script of everyday life. There's this story about a, a homo romantic person. Yeah. Okay. I think you can we now uh, hear you read. Victoria will you start. Yes. And you can tell us what yeah. you will read and why maybe. Yeah. Okay, um, so you can all hear me, right? Yeah. 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 Um, so I'm reading from uh, a new book that is coming out uh, this fall. And uh, I know it's cheating a little bit to not read from the anthology, but I've been reading from that novel for three years. And, uh, <laughs> so I wanted to do something else. But I chose a part that's uh, um, in many ways similar to 
the info to you. Um, so. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Á hverju ári grætir hún á ammalistæðin hans en ekki hins. Til að leyna samviskubiti segir hún við sjálfa sig að það sé að því að fæðing hans hafi verið svo erfið en er blættinast því út fyrir fram á sjö heilbriðistarfsmenn sem litu út þess að græna perur með plasthanska en hræðilegt Jésús minn segir fólk þegar hún rekur söguna Já, þú veist ekki hvernig er að eignast barn fyrir þú hefur næstu í dáið. Á hverju ári settur hún fyrrverandi eiginmanni sínum skilabóð, ég lifi. Á hverju ári svarar hann, ég veit. Sá yngri það meira á hann að halda, hann er svo línur, svo beinlaus, svo þögull, eins og sníill. Þegar hann er heima neitar hann að ganga, sess bara á rassin og hristir höfuðu, hún fara að bera hann um allt hús. Á leikskólanum ráðar hann um eins og áttaveldur köttur, býður þess að hún komi aftur til að taka hann upp. Sá eldri er allt öðruvísi, hann er beittur eins og skurðnýfur, skerin að hjarta með einu handtæki, blóðið flæði hljóðlaust og blottandi sárinu, svo dögg þegar það rennur, nánast svart. Sá eldri æfi fótbolta tvísöðu viku, gefur aldrei boltan því hann er bestur. Efnilegur strákurinn, segir þjálfarinn, flottur þessi litli, segja stóru strákarnir og sparka til hans boltanum. Sparka til hans boltanum, sparka til hans boltanum. Ljósmóðurinn kallaði þann eldri kraftalegan. Hann var farin að setjast upp allt og snemma, hleypa frá henni allt og snemma, með magavöðu að tveggja ára gamall. Hún lét hann lyft upp bollnum fyrir fram að vinkonu sína sem hlógu. Hvernig er þetta hægt? Hann hefur alla tíð verið háar eins og loftarós. Neitað að láta leiða sig, neitað að hlusta á neitt sem hún segir. Nennir ekki að vera barn, þarf ekki hita annara, handleggi annara, heyrir ekkert nema hugsanirnar í höfðinu á sjálfum sér. Hún heyrir hann komið götuna, heim á fótboltavellinu, öskrandi í síbyrju, mamma, 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 ásökuna tóttni með allarlega henni stofu, hún ringir strax í sem fyrrverandi. Þú verður að taka hann, ég ræður ekkert við þetta barn. Þegar sá eldri er farin, klartar hún öndinni léttar, heldur fast um volgan líkama þess yngri, þess mjúka sem þeir, hann er enn skrauðþur, flagnar eins og gamall trjábörgur utan á stofni, hún nuttar hann með þykku hvítu kröfi, klæðir hann í náttföld, nýtur þagnarinnar. Þá nótt liggur hún á gólfun í barnaherberginu, andvaka innan um vörubíla og plasti og blíjandstekningar á hausum, krassi, á hverri tekningu stendur með hennar eigin handskrift. Þetta er mamma mín, hér er mamma og mamma og mamma og ég. Brum, brum, host, brum, sendi það að bíl taktir fyrir utan sverðherbergis glukkanum með tónlistin í botni. Hún gæist á milli gardínana, nú er hún orðið þannig kona. Ég stýrið sér til vöðastrákur með ljóst hár og dyrhúfur. Starir á síman sinn. Ómeðvita er um þessa konu í myrkrinu sem starir á hann, stara á síman sinn. Loksins er drepið á bílnum, loksins heyrist í bílhörð skellast. Það fyrsta sem hún tekur eftir er hvað strigaskotnir hans eru skjanna hvítir, öklar við sólbrúnir eins og barnir eftir sólalandabörð, svo sér hún kúpinni eftir handakrikans. Hún horfir á hann hverfa en í húsið á móti, koma ekki út aftur. Hún kannast við fólki sem býrðar, Það hilsar ekki og á stóra hunda sem skýta eins og hross. Þegar hundarnir fara að gjamma, styrðlaður út í myrkrið, hringir hún ekki í hundra og tól, heldur sækir stærsta breiðnýfin sinn, setur undir kotta, festir þá loksins sveð. Dreymir rúllustiga og fólk með hnífa, djúpa tjörn inn í verslunamiðslið. Hún fyrir upp og niður og upp og niður en hefur týnt einhverju, hverju. Það er verið að loka, segir sviðlaus maður þegar hún stingur sér á kaf, Skóflar meðvindalausum sinni sínum upp á botninum, togar og togar og togar. Hvers vegna dreymir hann en ekki mig, öskur eldri sonurinnar? Það er eins og hann viti. Bítur hann svo fast í læri 
Hún fær blautan margblætt, rauðan og í lægin eins og sólin, rétt þar hún sest. Hún bendir að dökkri tannfyrun á lærinu og gargar. Sjáðu, sjáðu, sjáðu hvað þú gerðir. Eldri sonurinn að rúllar tunguna milli tannmúna, ruggar tönnunum. Ef hann reynir að stela hann lausu, segir hann og mikkar í átta litla bróður sínu. Men í drepa, men í berja með skublu, men í saga og með hausu, men í stinga með hníf, segir hann ógnandi og býður þess að hún svari. Ruggar og ruggar og ruggar tönnunum. Sorry, my, uh, I'm, I'm doing it from my phone and it just shut down. Okay. Here it is. I just had to restart it. <clears throat> it's quick. It, it, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very nice, it's called documents. Hún svarar honum ekki, hún þegir. Þögnina rennur ísköldum íbúðuna, nærum að beini. Ekkert er ég kallt og þögnmóður. Skrúfur í sundur, skítu og mokkakönnu, hellir morgunkorn í skál, Klæðir útlinn í ermar, skálmar. Hún þegir, drekkur kaffi, sleikir þumalinn, nuttar fyrir tringlega far á spanhellinni. Ég þóla ekki, ég þóla ekki svona krakka, segir hún loksins. Hausinn á hann er hálrún, fullur á nýstandi hljóði, eins og þrýstingurinn sé og mikil. Tóminni ítt í gegn og ómiklu hraða og hvert sinn sem hún vaknar hefur snjóa meira. Hvaðan? Þegar hún reynir að vekja strákuna í skólan, svarað er ekki. Hún slær flötum lófanum í kalda vegginn, opna munninn til að æpa. Frá vörum hennar berst sama óbærilega nýstandi hljóðið og fyllir á hann í höfuðið. Þeir grípa fyrir eyrun, opna ekki augun. Hún strunsar burt. Maður bakkar, sugsar hún og líður eins og hann langi brjóta eitthvað, en hann var blöyt í lófunum til að ná taki á nokkru brotættu, nema þá kannski þeim. Fyrirgefum mér, segir hún þegar þeir koma fram, fölir og kaldir. Fyrirgefum mér, ég kann þetta ekki, kannski geti ég þetta ekki. Það er eitthvað að blóðin í mér, segir hún og heldur þeim að stétta að sér hún getur. Ef þú hættir ekki mun ég sko drepa, mun ég drepa alla, hvíslar eldri sonurinnar og hristist allur. Ég drep þig, mamma, hvíslar svo yngri og tófur í annað eirað. Hann er með síðu, mjúku, eirnastemplana hennar. Hún þegir, hrærir í potti með höfrum og vatni, verður fyrir sér nakinn líkama sinni. Lítið fótur stendur út úr henni, hún togar í hann og fæðir annað barn, annan lítið líkama sem passar, eins og púst á milli dinglandi brjóstinnar, veldur henni líka vonbriðum, þó fyrst og síðast með sjálfa sig. Þeng ég verið það. Við vorum að spila spil sem á að auka nánd á milli para. Dregin eru spurningaspjöld, spurningarnar eru mispersónulegar, sumar frekar fyrirsjálegar, eins og þessi sem hún dró til að spyrja mig. Nefndu fimm hluti á bökkarlistanuðinu. Við sem tengslaverur erum öll gjörn á að vilja bara sjá það góða. Það getur verið okkar helsta ógjafa, komið okkur í miklar ógöngur. Einna helst tilfinningalegar, sem reyðir hann svo til að vinda upp á sig, keftir íbúð, hún vegfóruð og svo er það á hinnum óvöldustu stundum sem hlýð opnast og það er eins og það renni af manni einhver gæsku víma sem hefur því hlutverki að gegna að stífla tengslið við raunverulega. Ég þuldi samviskusamlega upp þeim hluti, að mig langaði að taka við sumabústa fóreldra minna, hjóla um vestfyrðina, ferðast um Indonesíu og fleira í þessum dúr. Hún horfði sviplaust á mig á meðan. Eftir að ég hafði lokið málum mínu var þögn. Mér leiðið svo ég hefði berað mig, deilt og miklu. 
Draumar mínir lágu á borðinu eins og innibli. Mér leið eins og óvendum gesti sem enginn heilsar. Það var enn þögn. Við vorum búnar að vera saman í fimm mánuði. Hún hafði gefið mér fallega gjafir. Alls konar sem hún hafði búið til sjálf, eldað fyrir mig og stundum þegar vel lá á henni komið fram við mig eins og prinsessu. Hún hafði ofnæmi fyrir þessu orði og var pyrruð þegar ég hrósaði henni með þessum frasa. Við vorum ólíkar. Það var skýrt frá byrjun. Allir sáu það nema hún. Munin á okkur leit hún á sem atriði sem þurfti að laga. Svo var eins og hún hefði sótt í sig veðrið og sagði, já, ok, ég vissi ekki að þú tríðir á bökkallista. Tríði á, það var ekki spurningin. Nei, ég veit, en þú svaraðir henni samt. Já, ég bara, já, svaraði. Já, fyrir mér er þetta hluti af ófyrirgefanlegri arfleið okkar hvíta fólksins. Fyrirlítilegt og hættulegt atriði í menningu hvítu millistjættarinnar. Við æðum um alla veröld með bökkallistan okkar, sópum fólki frá heimilum sínum, Svona farðu nú frá, þessi landskiki er á bökkallistanu mínu. Fyrir utan en tætilmennt atriðið er þetta klassísk leið til að vera ekki til staðar. Vera alltaf einhvers staðar annars staðar. Skapa sjálfsmynd með því sem við gerum, því sem við höfum gert, því sem við ætlum að gera. Öngunavert. Svo þegar listarnir eru teknir á okkur, vitum við ekkert hver við erum. Þegar eitthvað brestur sitjum við uppi með afleðingar þess að hafa ætt um veröldina, og búið okkur til með hlutum og gjörðum. Alls konar tvist og bast sjálfsmyndir sem þarf að tína upp úr bílskúskólfum og búsla saman. Þegar ljósin eru kveikt, blasa við full hús af alls konar drastli sem við höfum pikkað upp. Við finnum golfsett, það er hestur sem þarf að sinna í hesthúsinu sem reyndist vel um stund því þá þurfti ekki að vera heima á meðan, mikil vinna við elsku vinnu, sekkbretti í geymslunni, flugdrekar fyrir fullorna, hugsaði þér, Klifurskór, klifra sig bara ógna hraða út úr veröldinni og fá svo kvíðaröskun yfir álæginu. Gjörsamlega bögguð af öllum lífskeðunum. Mér langaði að grípa fram í fyrir henni en það hafði ég einu sinni gert og hún var svo hvumsa, kallaði mig hortuga, að ég lagði ekki í það. Fyrir í spilinu hafði hún leðrétt mig, skýrt fyrir mér hvernig best væri að setja skoðanum mínar fram. Hún hafði komið með þetta spil til að kynnast mér betur. Þarna rann upp fyrir mér að þessi kona vildi ekki kynnast neinum nema sjálfur sér. Undir fyrirlestrinum um bökkallistan og hvíta fólkið fann ég skýrst hvernig hún talaði á mig. Það var eins og að við í vindi, þetta var líkamlega upplifum. Ég upplifði óþægindi eins og sandur og mör fyrki og í andlitið að mér. Ég fann líka sterkt að ég hafði skyndilega stöðning, skyndilega stöðning. Það var eins og einhvers staðar djúft í rótum mínum hefði ég upplifað þetta áður. Jafnvel oft í mörgum lífu, líkt og formaður mínar væru í hérnum aldinnar búnar að fá nóg af henni og hennar líkum og kæmi nú og létu vita af sér. Ég fann tíðringin, losunina alveg upp í enni, óvæntar tilfinningar spruttu upp. Ég nenni ekki að sitja undir þessu, ég get ekki bóðið sjálfur mér upp á þetta. Hún truflar þanga mína, ertu ekki að hlusta á mig? Jú, ég er að hlusta, hún talar. Ég vissi að þegar hún liki máli sínu, myndi hún vilja láta baða sig í lofsyrðum um þessar fersku pælingar. Sú verður Lísa. Þegar hún er búin, ætla ég að standa upp og segja bless. Ég horfi á hann að tala í síðasta skiptið. Það er eins og hún minki með hverju orðinu. Eins og hún sé spariklættur lítill kall við það að hverfa undir borðið af smæð og skömm sem hún mun mögulega aldrei sjálf bera kennsl á. The second one is called Greni Trén. Við skiljum oft ekkert hvers vegna við erum stödd hér og þar í huganum. Finnum bara skyndilega hvernig kvíðabilgjurnar sindra af líkaman. Þú liggur til dæmis upp í rúmi og horfir sæl upp í loftið, afslöpuð þegar þú ert allt í hinu komin inn á milli Greni Trána. Þau eru ekki há, aðeins hærri en þú, en þau eru þétt. Í dag eru greni trén miklu stærri en þú og það er á svona stundum eina vísbendingin um að tími hafi í raun að vera liðið. Ég mann mjög lítið eftir atbyrðinum sjálfum. Mann stráka aðeins eldri en ég. Öll þrjú með girt niðrum okkur. Mann bara að þegar ég gekk frá staðnum fallegum stað í hverfinu þar er þyrping greni trjáa. 
þá runnu á mig þessi þingsl. Ég hafði hlaupið kát með þeim á bakvið trén á leiði einhvern leik, spennt og áhyggjulaus, en í miðum leiknum fann ég að þetta var eitthvað spes leikur, eiginlega ekki leikur. Þetta var ekki vont fyrir neitt, ekki gott fyrir neitt. Þetta var bara eitthvað sem þessi strákar höfðu hilt að það væri spennandi að gera. Allir gerðu þetta. Það væri flott að hafa gert þetta fyrir þá. Ég vissi ekkert hvað var í uppsiklingu. Þó, ég, þó hafði ég samþykkt þetta, ég hafði bara ekki skilning á orðunum. Á leiðinni til baka full skapaðist skilningurinn sem hafði kveikt með þegar við girtum niðrum okkur. Það rann upp fyrir mér að ég hafði gert eitthvað óafturkreft. Ég sem góða, fallega, brúða stelpan var horfin. Ég sem barn var horfin. Ég var fjarræn í leikjum og barnahópum. Ég hvarf á nokkrum mínútum undir hlass sem var þyngra en ég gat borið. Líf mitt skiptist í fyrir og eftir. Fyrir og eftir grefnitrén. Atvikið tók mig í burtu og setti í staðinn eitthvað sem ég skildi ekki. Ég fann doða, tóm, leiða, horfði skeytingalaus og reið á barnaefni í sjónvarpinu, hræddist sjálfa mig, þessa nýju stelpu sem hafði fyrirvaralaust svikið alla, mig ekki síst. Eftir marga daga af þessu ástandi settist mamma hjá mér og spurði mig hvað væri að. Ég sagði henni frá grenitrán, köld og hrætt. Hún tók á móti, sagði mér að svona leikir væri algengir hjá börnum og eftir spurningar og svör ráðlaði mér að eiga líkama minn út af fyrir mig þangað til ég væri tilbúin að deila honum með öðrum. Hún fullirti líka að af þessu atviki undir grenitrannum bæri ég engan skafa, enga skömm, enga sett. Hún brosti og sagði mér að gleyma þessu. En ég gleymdi þessu ekki. Tilfinningarnar, uxu og yfirfærðust á aðra hluti. Ég lendi aftur og aftur í þessum þungu, fyrirverðalausu svikum við sjálfa mig að gjörðir mínar kviktu á tómi og örmætingu. Hafði ekki kort yfir hvar væri örugt að stíga niður fæti. Skömm og sekt virtust fylgja hverri gjörð. Ég var sífelt mér að framandi og ókunnug. Eftir erfitt tímabili lífinu fór ég til ráðgjafa sem sagði að þetta aðtug væri sivjaspell. Sivjaspell? Nei, það gerir lítið úr öðrum alvöru sivjaspellsmálum. Sásöki og áföld virka ekki þannig, sagði ráðgjafinn. Taka ekki hvert frá öðru. Frekar þvert á móti, hjálpa, auka einsýn og samkend þegar við notum merkingar á mis stóra atburði. En hér var engi fullorðin, ekkert þannig séð kynferðislegt. Hvað er kynferðislegt? Og það sem mestu skipti, enginn sem framdi ofbeldi. Þeir voru eldri, segir hún, en þeir vildu mér ekki ílt. Þeir fóru ekki yfir mörkin mín, ég sagði já, ég er til. Sagði spennt, ég, ég, fattaði svo allt saman eftir á. Þú getur unnið með þetta sem ofbeldisreynslu þótt þú skilgreinir þá ekki sem ofbeldismenn. Beitti ég mig ofbeldi? Varla. Hvernig leið þeim eftir þetta? Hvað hafði ég, lítil stelpa, heyrt um hreinar meyjar? Að stelpur ættu ekki að sofa hjá mörgum strákum. Að líkami minn yrði ekki minn á einhverjum tímapúti. Jafnvel þó mamma mín segði það. Jafnvel þótt mér fyndist að sjálfri. Hvaðan kom þetta tröllatak skammarinnar sem veistu sterkari en allt? Huggunarorðin, rökhugsunin, sterkar en tíminn sem átti að lækna. Ef skömmin nær einhver tíman að hverfa, er alltaf einhver hluti eftir eins og til áminningar. Eins og bein sem sitja eftir, löngu eftir að allt annað er horfið inn í hringrásina. Ég finn fyrir leifunum eins og litlum knúð á bakvið orðin. Nei, á bakvið húðina. Áminningu og ég vanda mig hvernig ég tala og hugsa. Greni tré eru út um allt. I would like uh, for you to comment a little bit on the literary scene in uh, Iceland. So when I was sending these uh, flash uh, interviews, reads or flash interviews, many of you, uh, many of the writers told that the scene is 
like some type of uh, energetic, some form of word, energetic, lively, and everything, but poor, like having no money. So could you comment that uh, a bit, what, it, what it's like to be a writer in Iceland, and especially what it's like to be a female writer in Iceland, because just before this conversation, we were talking in the office about the Icelandic uh, uh, Women Literary Awards, so maybe you can comment on that, too, for the end. Uh, yeah, I just because we were talking about it on the plane here, that uh, it's something uh, very beautiful about the literary scene in Iceland that it's very like uh, welcoming and supportive. By we both experienced it when we like uh, published our first book that a lot of uh, older uh, writers, like especially female writers, but also men writers like uh, sent us like good words on Facebook and friends requests and like so like I'm with you yeah yeah very good book and like yeah it's very like supportive and friendly scene I think like comparing to theater I think in that there's a lot of more fear like with new voices like okay what are they oh, something new when they always have some like this new thing that they're coming in like what's that uh, that, that's not like that in the literacy, I think. It's very nice to hear, yeah. Yeah, it's very much like pay it forward, you know. Uh, yeah. More experienced writer, uh, writers uh, would send you, uh, uh, you know, encouragement, which is mm -hmm. really, really uh, precious. And then you try to do the same, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. And do you want to comment a bit on the uh, Icelandic Women's Literary Award and the necessity for it? Yeah, um, it, yeah, because uh, it was I started uh, sometime in 2006 or something. Uh, we, I was actually just googling it when we were talking about it because <laughs> it didn't have the numbers in my head. But it was started uh, from the grassroots group uh, in the Icelandic Authors Union um, out of necessity because they thought it was important to, um, um, you know, to to uh, lift up female writers more, and they thought also um, both a division in uh, nominees and recipients of the Icelandic Literary Prize uh, were like, uh, I don't know, 11 women and 36 guys, I think it said, and then men, and then um, also like thir uh, a lot more men would be receiving the uh, writer's stipend in Iceland than women. So they started their own award to kind of like lift up women and to raise awareness. And I think it's uh, definitely worked. I think it's a lot better now. Okay, uh, with these optimistic uh, words, we will finish our conversation. Uh, conversation. Thank you, Bertora. Thank you, uh, Eva. Thank you, uh, everyone in the audience. Uh, do you have any questions, perhaps? <laughs> of course I have. Uh, when you when you were talking about the Torah uh, about your process of intuitive writing, the first thing that came to my mind was uh, Delilo's, uh, and it's not only him, but I thought of him. Don Delilo claims that he doesn't know what he thinks before he starts writing. Mm. So, and to me, it always sounded very cerebral, mm -hmm. very intellectual. Like you know, you have to collect your thoughts and which I'm, I completely understand what he means, but it struck me as a complete opposite from both you and Eva Rune were explaining as your processes. Mm -hmm. But I, I still would like to, to know whether your processes also allow you to, to kind of come up with the things that you think, but you are still not aware that you are thinking them, if it makes sense. <laughs> um, if. If, if the process allows me to come up with things that I'm thinking of. Uh, I think it's intuitive in a way that, uh, you, know, you, 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 uh, you know, as a writer, I think a lot of us have like these obsessions and we're trying to get them out of our systems. Um, you know, some got it bad, some, some less so. Um, uh, and I think, I mean, I always, like when I'm writing a novel, I start with uh, an idea uh, but then ideas usually suck, 
And I always change the idea, like I always end up with something completely different from what the idea was, but it's like you have to have some map, something to guide you along the way, but then it changes. So I think as you're writing, it comes through, like, you know, those um, intuitive, uh, you know, these things that you're trying to get rid of your system, like maybe your great-great-grandmother's trauma or something is mm -hmm. <laughs> coming through you in a way, but uh, whatever it is, it comes through in the process itself, like this, uh, the, you know, the moment when you really are out of your mind, you know, when you are just kind of, you know, you, you haven't eaten and you're like sweating a little bit or something and you had way too much coffee, and but you're just writing and writing and then it's like you, you go out of yourself a little bit. Okay. So that's when it comes through, I think. Thank you. Okay, any more questions? Okay, sure. <coughs> uh, just because we uh, got a little glimpse of what what Bergthora is doing next, uh, I would like to ask you, Evaron, if you could tell us a little bit about the project you're working on at the City Theatre. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I am uh, uh, doing this uh, participatory documentary theatre about the AIDS uh, pandemic in Reykjavik in the uh, 80s and 90s. And uh, it's focused also on the queer scene. So uh, yeah, it will be uh, a piece in in two parts. Uh, the first part will uh, uh, the audience will get it sent to their homes, and they will listen to uh, interviews with the many voices, many people who experienced it from different ankles, uh, one man who uh, lost his uh, partner and all his friends, and then the nurse who like came and like took over the hospital and no one in the hospital wanted to like assist and no one wanted to like uh, take any blood samples and so she had to like go into all rooms um, of the hospital. So her uh, stories are also very uh, uh, crazy, like it's just crazy. Like after experiencing this uh, COVID thing, also, uh, and yeah, they experience this uh, like very difficult part of the piece in their home, in just the safe space of their home, and also uh, will be na narrated by uh, story uh, these uh, storytellers which will uh, let you, let the audience uh, interact with the sound piece. And then after this part, uh, everyone will go and meet up in the city theater and they will have a gathering, this kind of a party uh, slash memorial uh, moment there with the <coughs> queer uh, people. Okay, more questions? Okay, uh, thank you once again. Please stay for the next conversation that will start uh, in a minute. Uh, Anja Tomljena, which will solve Bjorn Sigurdsson and Jonas Reiner Gunnarsson. Thank you.